Hi. Uh, my, name's, my name is Karen Adler, and um, I just want to welcome you to a conversation again with Cherie McCoy, who is the leading practitioner and founder, with along with the Gongli, of self acceptance training. She's traveled the world doing all kinds of transformative workshops. I've worked with her myself for 30 years, and I barely miss one uh, because of how powerful they are, um, combining uh, a, a bunch of modalities like the salt, bioenergetics. Uh, meditation, spirituality, all sort of in service and br of, in, of bringing us into our bodies, into the energy of our bodies and the flow of our bodies, feeling more peaceful, more vitality. And it is quite a powerful uh, modality. And with the, um, with the holidays upon us, I think a lot of us are feeling the pressure of the holiday. A lot of issues come up around the holidays. Layer that with a pandemic going on for three years. There's some uh, challenges that come up around this time of year that I know in working with my own clients as a therapist have really helped them find this sort of vast universe within instead of looking at it from kind of a bleak place or a stressful place that the holidays can bring. It brings up loneliness, family issues, um, grief, uh, stress, all kinds of financial stress, all kinds of stuff. So we thought it would be a good time to kind of uh, share some of the wisdom, some of the tools. Um, and I thought we should go to the source, Cherie McCoy. And so I'm going to hand it to you and maybe we can kind of tackle um, loneliness, which I think is maybe, I don't know, the primary one I hear in working with people and talking to people. And uh, maybe through the lens of self-acceptance, you know, some tools and some ideas around that. So I'll let you kick that off. Okay, it's wonderful to be with you in this modality <laughs> again, because I think self-acceptance is something that we all need. I know at my age, I'm still using the tools um, to get through um, these last three years and all that's happened to me in those last three years. I use the tools every day. So I'm glad to be talking about it. And um, so let's uh, look at loneliness, as you say, first of all. And I wanna start by telling a story you've heard me tell probably several times already, the story of the musk deer. And the musk deer was um, born, dropped out of its mother's womb onto the ground, and it smelled this amazing smell. And it just loved that smell, and it struggled to its feet and started to kind of try to walk, and then eventually ended up running after this smell. And it ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran until it was exhausted and dropped again to the earth. And then it discovered that the smell was coming from itself. Well, this is an important story because we are all the musk deer. We all have that amazing smell, which I call love. It's who we really are. We are divine love. And it's only to be found within us. But we, like the musk deer, have that first, with the first breath we take, we smell that smell. And we think it's in the outer world because the breath came when we came out of the mother's womb. We, I know that we already sensed it in the mother's womb. But somehow when we took that first breath, we felt this wonderful smell, love. And so we are all chasing the smell of love. And people chase it in material stuff. They chase it in doing a good job. They chase it in relationships. And they never quite find it. And that's where the world today is at. Everybody is a musk deer. Running, running, running to exhaustion looking for love and it's so simple it's there in the heart you know i often tell my clients and i really learn myself is that you can be in a room with a million people who love you and feel alone yes you can be alone 
and feel full and like you have a million people around you. So it really is that it's that searching inside. So what would be a tool that you would recommend for somebody who's really struggling with that feeling? The real only tool is breath because we come in, we take a deep breath and that's when we discover it, like the musk deer. He smelled this wonderful smell. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the breath is the most important thing we can do. And I always tell, I start my work, and you know this from your work also, you start by breathing. And if people can learn to take, to take a little time each day and take a long, slow, deep breath into their heart and letting their belly expand with it. And then even more important, the exhalation, long, long, long exhalation with a stop at the end. Oh, you'll hear my dog. He's uh, a broker. Breathing with you. <laughs> and so that Stopping at the end of that exhalation is what many people are teaching. I've been teaching it, well, since I learned it from my pregnancy and that way back in 68, uh, 67, with the book, Childbirth Without Fear. Dr. Stanley Dick Reed, if the book is still around, was teaching this way of breathing because without, with, by breathing this way, you number one, go into an altered state. And number two, your body lets go of the baby without pain. And I teach this with pregnant women and I, try, I teach it with everybody that I work with. The breath is the most important thing because it takes us into our heart. Now, loneliness, which we all deal with in one way or another, if you, when you start to breathe this way, the energy comes up the back of the, on the back, around the head and down into the heart. Well, most people don't want to get into their heart because there's a lot of feelings in there, right? Before the love, before I feel the love, I'll sometimes feel the sadness. So they block it either in the jaw and have a tight jaw or a tight throat. But if they can let go and go into the heart, they're first of all gonna start feeling whatever feelings are there. And I encourage them if they're really lonely to feel that loneliness, they may start to cry. I encourage them to use the voice, which is energy and to wail. And I know you do this in your work also. And the wailing starts the energy to move and the heart opens up. And that energy, which we carry inside of, of ourselves, not only inside, but our, around us too. It's called the electromagnetic field, which is who we really are. I always tell people, we are energy made flesh. And this energy is divine love. And when I breathe in this way, after a time, I will either feel my sadness, cry, wail, and then I go into an altered state. Maybe I don't have to even feel that. Maybe when the heart opens up, I start to feel the love. And scientists have now discovered that unless we love ourselves, we can't really love other people. And if you look around at the world, it were, they're so full of fear and anger. And when you open your heart, you start to feel other emotions. And that goes into heart coherence, which I'll talk a little bit about. When you breathe into your heart, the heart they've discovered has neurons, which are brain cells. The heart actually has neurons. And the heart is the most important energy center in the body because those neurons when the heart starts to open the heart sends a, a chemical message i don't know what that chemical is to the brain 
and the brain slows down, the heart slows down, the autonomic nervous system kicks in, and then the brain sends a chemical called oxytocin to the thymus gland, which is right behind the heart center. And that thymus gland not only creates stem cells that heal, that go throughout the whole body and heal, but it also creates elevated emotions like love, like commit, uh, compassion, forgiveness, and mostly gratitude, which we'll talk about later. So they've, they've actually, HeartMath Center has actually done a lot of this chemical, uh, this, uh, scientific work on, on the heart. And um, they have discovered that even when we look into our animals' eyes, oxytocin gets released in the animal and in us. And you can have, that's why a lot of elders, myself included, really have to have an animal with them. Because they turn around, my, my dog sits on my lap with his butt in my belly and turns his head around and looks at me. We spend a lot of time looking at each other, just feeling the love. You know, in your book, uh, Becoming Alive and Real, which I suggest people read because it gives great case examples and what this kind of looks like in practice. But you talk about how the skin is the largest organ and really, you know, how we're starving for touch in our culture. And that may really have a lot to do with the feeling of loneliness and how to, how do you, how do you, uh, how would you address that issue? Um, well, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up, Karen, because when the heart opens, people will often tell me, wow, I'm feeling my hands. And that tells me that the heart is open. As I'm, as I'm working with people and the way you work with people, we work with the body sensations because the body tells us what's really going on much more than the analytical mind. So we're working with body sensations and letting the body tell us. So when, it, when the heart opens, people will often say, oh, I'm feeling my hands. The hands are the work organ of the heart center, sometimes called the chakra. And that's where we send energy out. And healers use their hands, whether they touch you or do Reiki, whatever they're doing, they use their hands because that's the, the work organ of the heart. Now, every, any energy center in the body has a work organ and a sense organ. And the sense organ is the skin. That's the biggest organ in the body. It's the largest organ in the body. It is an organ. And that's where we take energy in. And yeah, that's why COVID has really done a trip on all of us. We don't touch, and we don't even before COVID, we don't touch enough. And we need to be touched. So how would I deal with that? Well, I do a lot of exercise, I, I work with my body, I touch my body, and I hug. I hug my family whenever I'm around them. I hug my dog, you know, and I, I really feel it in my skin. Massage is a great thing. Rolfing is a wonderful way to open a lot of the energy centers in the body. And when I'm Rolf, my son is a Rolfer, and when I'm Rolf, and the way he does it, it's very slow, very deep, but very slow, so we don't, I don't feel pain. I know it has had a bad reputation until they started going slower into the body. And you go, as you've been, you've been Rolf by Kevin, so you know that you go into an altered state with him and with a good Ralpher, you actually go into a deep altered state oh, because yes. the skin is the sense organ of the body which goes into the heart, the heart opens and you go into an altered state, which you do with this breath too. And I'm all about altered states, you know that. Oh, yes. And that's, that's the goal of self-acceptance. When people, 
have emotions and I ask them to go into an orgasm of the emotion. And once that emotion, not just like dribble a couple of years, tears, but to really feel it and express it with sound, whatever it is, anger, sorrow, whatever comes up, fear, to really release it, not release it, but discharge it throughout the body with sound. And then an altered state ensues. The other day I was working with a, a client of mine who's had a Kundalini experience and is working to really hard to ground the energy uh, instead of letting it overwhelm her. And I coined the phrase, you finally, when she was letting it ground into the earth, I said, now you have experienced a motion orgasm, a motion orgasm. It's not going being released in a screen, but it is a motion. She was going all over the place, but it was going into her feet. Yes. She was shaking crazily all over. And I and think people are afraid of that, you know, but a lot really of people are terrified. And when it first happened to her, um, it was fun for her. She was letting it happen, but people around her got scared and then she got scared of it. And she's learning that it's a wonderful experience if I can put it into the ground. So, you know, I have to she had a motion instead of having an emotional orgasm. She had a motion orgasm. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I have a young client who I'm so proud of. She, I've seen her since she was 14. She's 24 now. And she gets it. She's doing all kinds of body-centered stuff. And she sets up joy stations. And they're booths. And she she dances and she moves her body. And she goes and she hugs people who look like they need a hug. She asks them first. But it's so, you can just see people melting with that. Oh. Just that longing to be touched right? So we, can, yeah. we do whatever we can to try to make sure we get that. Yeah. So the breath and touch is very important. So let's move on. There's so many topics. And again, your book is really, uh, I listen to it whenever I'm going to talk to you, interview you, do one of your workshops. I, I, I get it on audio so I can hear your voice. And I learn something new every time. It's not even a long book, but it's just it's a very short book. <laughs> it's so rich in material. It's, it's incredible. So let's go on to family since a lot of people have family triggers or family expectations or, or are absent families and feel like they're the only ones in the world who have no family to be with. So I just wanted to see, you know, what you had to say about you know, how to work with, um, in, with you feeling like, you know, you're triggered by your family or you have these expectations and get disappointed or whatever. Yeah, we all have triggers and they come from the trauma of child, childhood. Everybody has, has trauma. There's not, I mean, I've, I've worked with people who say, oh, I, I've had a happy childhood and perhaps that's true. And there's also trauma. A lot of us have just pushed it down and forgotten it. And it comes out later. And it certainly comes out in triggers, what we call triggers. And those triggers, if I can start to become aware of my triggers, then I can work with it. Most people do not know that they're being triggered all the time. They're being triggered in the office, at a, at a job, and especially around families. Family dynamics are full of triggers. And so here we come to these wonderful holidays that we're all looking forward to. And as Dick used to say, Dick, was, Dick Alney was my teacher, mentor, lover, partner, many things, everything to me, the love of my life. And I thank him every day because he gave me this work. We developed it together, but he was really a brilliant man. Anyway, um, he used to say, expectation is the mother of resentment. Mm -hmm. And so we go into these family expect, expecting to have a wonderful day or a wonderful time, and then we get triggered. And again, the... And, you know, or we, or we get um, a lot of people are getting going on Facebook 
and getting triggered and having arguments on Facebook. I can't believe this, what's mm -hmm. happened in our culture because everybody's triggered all the time and they aren't even aware that they're triggered. And then my trigger, I might, you might say something, it triggers me, I might say something back and it triggers you and there we are. Mm -hmm. And whether I say it or not, I'm triggered. And by whatever reaction I'm having out of my trigger, whether I say it back to you, you feel it and you're triggered. Mm -hmm. And that, that's our culture today. It's the world culture, which is so sad to me because people are not aware that they are being triggered. The triggers that are happening, first of all, I don't realize that I'm being triggered. I'm all of a sudden feeling angry, pissed off, or scared, you know, of something you have said. Maybe you just made a, com a, a, a slight comment. I have a friend that is working um, and as a receptionist, and the boss will make a slight comment, and she is sure she's losing her job. That's her trigger from her childhood. And she's starting to be aware of it, you know. So how do you bring people to that awareness? To start to be aware that, you know, they always say, oh, yeah, it's all about you. Yes. Everything that happens to me is all about me. Always. And it's not about you. So you say something, I feel something. That is all about me. That's my trigger. And once I start to realize, because most people don't realize that they're triggered, they're just feeling pissed or angry or scared. They do not realize that they are triggered and it goes back. I always say, look behind you. It's not about that person. It's back there in your childhood. What specifically happened to you? People say, oh yeah, I had a horrible childhood. No, go back and even if you can't remember, make up a memory. It's your choice, you know, it's your imagination. There's nothing wrong with it. Make up a memory and deal with it back there. You know, how did it feel? You don't remember it, but how did, how did it feel? And what could have happened back there? Make it up, it doesn't matter. Then you can let it go. Because if you don't make it up, if you don't deal with it, it's gonna be plaguing you forever. So I don't care about making it up. And then, then, you, then you can heal it by going back and pretending it's different. So pretend is a very important aspect of this work, of working on yourself, because then you can heal the trauma, whether you made it up or not. They actually, they're discovering again that a lot of what we think happened to us was made up. You know, many of the memories that we think happened to us were made up. In fact, when I was working on my main trauma, I remember squeezing a towel and screaming over and over and over every night, every night, every night. And I really believed it happened every night of my childhood. The more I worked on it, the more I realized, oh no, it was only from five to 10, oh no, it was only you know, at five or seven. Oh, it probably only happened about every other month, maybe once a month. But to the child, that, that's every night, every night, every night, right? Right. So make it up, it's okay. You know, use your imagination, our imagination um, I think it was Einstein said, said the imagination is much more Im important than your analytical mind mm -hmm. because that's how we go into altered states and create mystical experiences. And the analytical mind distorts, like you said, distorts history. Distorts history. The body is, you know, you know, when you go into those memories or you feel something in the body, if you follow it, it sort of takes you to the actual truth because the body's holding it, it's suspended in time for when it happened, wanting to be released. Right. And when you can kind of go into the memory and let yourself feel it, then it can dissipate. That's Otherwise right. you're making it stronger when you're thinking about it or trying to remember exactly. it. Exactly. 
Yeah. You're letting it run your life. And many people, and the thing again, again, the brain, when I start to think a certain thought like, oh, they're going to fire me, they're going to fire me, the brain sends a chemical to different parts of the body that make you feel like they're going to fire me. And that feeling, that fear, probably in the, in the gut, you know, the chemical comes from the brain into the gut and I feel fear, but it starts with the thought. Yes. Thoughts are so important to be aware. We'll talk more about that. But I wanted to address what you said, what your original question, how do you deal? So now I'm aware. That's the first step to any change. I have to be aware. And the second step, again, is the breath. Mm -hmm. So when I'm triggered, and I'm triggered, I'm triggered by my family, because they're, you know, they're the, my children, and they say things that triggers me, triggers my childhood that I haven't worked on back there. I'm shocked. I'm still dealing with it. And when I get triggered, I take a deep breath, a long, slow breath, which takes me into my body. And they've said something, right? And whatever they do with that, they're going to do with it. It's happened to me when I'm, one of my children has triggered me. And in, in the past, I've been triggered and I've reacted. And all of a sudden, I realize, oh, that makes me feel like a little girl. What happened to me back there? I go back there and deal with that. Things I wouldn't even, I don't remember anything. I make it up. I deal with it. And then they say it again or something again that triggers me. I'm still triggered. I take a long, deep, slow breath, taking me into my body where I feel safe. This is who I am. This energy made flesh, this divine love, which is who I really am. I'm not anything anyone thinks of me. Some people think I'm amazing. Other people think she thinks she's everything. I had a person, I had a client say, Tree, you think the whole world revolves around you. And I didn't get triggered. I thought, yeah, that's true. <laughs> true. They all they all are around me. They believe everything I say. They think I'm great. My family thinks I'm an amazing mother. <laughs> the whole world does revolve around me. <laughs> So I I'm really triggered by that. Thank God. You taught, us, you taught us in one of your groups. You're like, you're. I'm in charge of my group. You're in charge of your group. You know, we all have our own group, right? It's true. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, there's a couple mantras that you've given me that I've really loved with that, especially with family work, where you, you know, once you're in that sort of restful place, you've had that body orgasm, whatever it is, where you breathe down to your feet and you're feeling sort of some tingling and you're really kind of in that space of who you are and you say, I am me and you are you and where we meet or if we meet. If we wow. meet, it's wonderful. And if not, it can't be helped. That's an old saying from the 70s. I forget who, who uh, said it first, but it's an old saying. The other, the, the other mantra I tell people is to, number one, be aware of that thought. Oh, I'm going to get fired or, oh, she doesn't like me. And breathe and say, oh, my mind, oh, my mind, have mercy on my mind. Oh, my mind, oh, my mind, have mercy on my mind. I once was with this great being, Bawa Muhayadeen. And he said that over and over for a half hour. And they, he, he said it, I think, in Malayalam or whatever his language was. He was from Sri Lanka. And um, he was just saying it in Malayalam or his language. And someone was translating it at the same time. And I have a tape of that for a half hour. Oh, my mind. Oh, my mind. Oh, have mercy. Oh, my mind. Have mercy. Oh, my mind. Oh, my mind. Oh, my mind. So I tell people when you catch yourself, do that mantra. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> the other one is um, I can only be who I really am. I love that one. I love that. that. Yes, that 
was an amazing experience in my life in this work because I've told this story, you've heard it before, but I had been training with Dick for three years, sitting at his feet, traveling with him all over the country. I would be assisting him, but mostly I'd be sitting at his feet and picking his brain afterwards. Why'd you do this? Why did you do that? Why'd you do this? And that's how I learned. And then I started doing some private practice. I had not done a group. And we get into, we're living in, in uh, um, outside of Milwaukee at the time. And we get in the car and he's, he had a professional training for a year in Chicago, which is where you are. I, I wanna tell people that you are an amazing self-acceptance trainer and you are in Chicago, Karen Adler. Anyway, so we get in the car and Dick says to me, well, there's enough people for two groups once a month we're going to do a weekend once a month for a year. And because there's so many people, you'll take one group, I'll take the other, and we'll switch back and forth every month. So they have a group, a month with you and a month with me. And I said, oh my God, I can't do a group. I've never done a group. I, I don't know. I, I, and we had a big fight, of course, because <laughs> I was terrified. And then I, I just shut up finally. And I started saying that mantra, I can only be whatever I am. I can only be whatever I am. I'm breathing and feeling it, breathing and feeling it. And you know, I am the most important words there are. I am it takes you right into who you are, this energy. Benji, Benji. Hey. And you know, um... Families are the ones that create the expectations. So before you walk into before the- Before you, before we go there, just hold that thought because I'm going to stop him and- Hey, Nancy, come here. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this is COVID with a dog. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, I want to finish that story because I did that mantra all day long while people did their work. And somehow the work was amazing. People said for years that first workshop was the best one. It was better than what we did with Dick. <laughs> well, I was because I was totally in my body. And you know from training with me all these years that the only way to do this work as a therapist is to be in your body. And believe me, when you're in your own energy field, this electromagnetic field, which connects you to everything there is and nothing, <laughs> quantum, your intuition is like that. Because you're not thinking, oh my God, what do I hear? What do I do here? Well, this guy, this needs this, and this person needs this. No. This yeah. is the easiest work flows world and I, I you know you know that you get so much out of this work because you're sitting in your energy and allowing the person to do their work and the intuitions come like that I'm sorry now that's the end of that story so oh, what I was going to say is you know since you know, it's families that create the expectations we have, you know, so when you go in, you feel a lot of anxiety because of, you know, trying to, you know, explain your life or something or justify who you are. And that mantra, I, I can only be who I really am, kind of gets you right back in so that you are in yourself and not in the expectations of others. So before you walk in the door for Christmas or Hanukkah or <laughs> Thanksgiving, whatever, you kind of can settle into yourself and just be who you really are. Because clearly that's what your family really wants is for you to just be you. That's right. You might not know that, but. Yeah, they might, they don't know that, but that's really what they want. And that's, again, that musk deer. We all deer. want that love. Yeah. We all want that love, and it's just a breath away, a long, deep, slow breath, inhaling, holding it, and then exhaling all the way, slowly, 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 and stopping at the end for just a few seconds. Yeah. So that's that simple. That's simple. <laughs> 
That simple. So let's touch upon since you, is it okay to go to the next week? Well, I want to talk a little bit about trauma. I, I'm, we've already talked about that. And the fact that why the breath works, they've discovered that when you do, when you do that kind of breath, that you go into an altered state and it slows down the brain waves, it actually slows your brain waves. And they, you know, when I first was doing this work, I heard about brain waves. I heard about the quantum, but I didn't really know it or study it like I have since COVID. And I've discovered that, you know, we are, when we sleep, we are in Delta, which is the, the deepest brain wave, the slowest brain wave. And then just before we fall to sleep, and just as we wake up, we're in theta. This is the unconscious, which therapists for years have been saying that we live most of our life out of the unconscious. And the child, from the time they're in utero, they are in theta, the unconscious brain wave. And they are, believe it or not, we are picking up all the tensions that are in our mother's body. So whatever that mother is going through, plus whatever she's picked up from her mother and her mother and her mother. So they, they talk about ancestral trauma these days, but we, we literally are just, we, we don't have the mental capacity to synthesize what's going on. And then we're born and they say the first seven years or so, we are still in that theta state, unconscious. Even after we learn how to talk, we still don't know how to synthesize what's really going on. So we just put it in our body. And Wilhelm Reich was like the great grandfather of my work, who was a colleague and best, was the closest to, um, uh, to um, Freud. And Freud said, you know, what we need to learn next because Wilhelm Reich was a scientist. He said, we need to find out what is going on in the body. And Freud got really excited about energy. And, and so he discovered, I think he was the first one to really discover that the trauma is in the body, not in the mind. What the mind does with it, of course, ruins all our lives. <laughs> but anyway, so theta is the unconscious state. And around seven, we start to come out of theta into alpha, which is the created state. And that's the state that the heart goes into when we start to breathe like that, the creative state. We are all creating our reality with our thoughts and with our breath. If you don't breathe right, and if you don't breathe much, you're probably in your head a lot thinking, and in that alpha state, you are creating probably misery. If you breathe, you can create whatever you want. And that's why you use your imagination. Use your imagination, and especially if you're elder like me. Boy, really use the love imagination to keep yourself, because attitude is everything, even if you're young like you you know, or younger. Attitude is everything. So that's the alpha state. That's the creative brain state. Then there's beta. And there's three beta states. Beta one, where we are learning, like right now, if people are listening to this, they may or may not be learning, but that's the learning state, beta one. Beta two is where we're doing something that we love to do, like right now, I'm do, I love doing this. I love teaching. I think of myself more as a teacher than a therapist. People call me their therapist, but really I'm just a teacher. And <clears throat> so that's beta two. It's something you love to do, but there's a little bit of stress around it, you know, a little bit of stress because you want to do it right. Mm -hmm. Beta three, i.e. disease. Beta three is stress. And stress is disease in the body. 
And that's the unfortunate place where our world is in right now with fear, anger, striving, doing too much, running around, buying, 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 you know, all those things the musketeer does to find the love they're looking for. So I wanted to talk about this, uh, those states. Of course, I'm glad, you did. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought up sort of how, you know, the stress is, you know, that's really what we were going to talk about was really how stress the political climate, financial stress, um, the media, social media, and the way it kind of takes, d creates division because it feeds off fear. And so if you're watching the news, if you're watching, you know, on social media, you get pulled into those stress states, yeah. uh, which puts you in your head, which makes you, you know, I always say, you know, a lot of the activism out there is really trauma being played out. Exactly. <laughs> and if people who did this work, there would be more peace on earth and we'd come together and realize we have more in common than different. But yeah, so you're really actually touching upon what, you know, what we wanted to talk about, which was really how these, how stress, you know, is, is such a player in disease and in, in, and in dysfunction in the world and how to, um, what are some tools for that so that you can kind of steer away from that? Well, number one is be aware. Aware. Be aware. And the media, really, I tell people, don't watch the news. I haven't watched the news for years. And people used, friends of mine used to say, oh, you're just putting your head in the sand. And I'd say, yeah, put my head in the sand. <laughs> I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. If I were a political person, maybe then, maybe then, although many politicians get lost in the power, the power of it and wanting to get reelected. And that's, uh, that's really a sad thing that, that we don't have many statesmen that really are, are working for the people. Because from the right again, people are out of touch with their bodies. If they were in touch with their bodies, they would be much more in the love state, the love state, the accepting state, the gratitude state, which we'll talk about. But yes, the, stay away from the news and the media because I've seen it wreck relationships. People are fighting over on Facebook. I'm, I'm like shocked when I hear, and sometimes I have clients that are fighting with people on Facebook. I tell them, Stop, you have a choice. So be aware, number one, ooh. And this is what happened, you know, because I've been alone since COVID mostly. And um, I started really um, watching YouTube because I have doctors that I follow and spiritual people that I follow. And I may have touched on something political once and all of a sudden, all this political crap starts coming on my YouTube. And I'm thinking, oh my God, how did that happen? You know, well, I touched one thing and all of a sudden all this stuff comes up and it's still coming up. And now I don't click on it, aware, I'm aware. And if I click on something that ends up being, the other day, my daughter sent me this uh, thing by one of the doctors I follow. And this doctor has gotten political. And she thought it was, she thought the, the YouTube that thing that she sent me was about health. And if it, actually, it probably was, but by the time I got it, it was about politics. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh, everybody's getting lost in the political arena. So oh. awareness first. If I can be aware that that's all over my YouTube now, I do not click on it. It they, they are <clears throat> catchy things that'll rope you in. So awareness, don't click on it. Find something that you're really interested in. And be aware of politics. Be aware of the, the media and of the news. You know, uh, there, there's a woman in my training right now who's a, a wreck because she watches the news, you know? 
you ended up doing work and it went way, way back. So it was just a trigger to something in childhood. So if everyone yeah. was able to go back to that, then she came to this place of peace and she didn't even remember what she was even mad about. <laughs> exactly, because that's the world is triggering us. The politics is triggering all of us and we can choose not to be triggered. There's nothing we can really do to change things. Yes, you can vote. I encourage people to vote, but don't get lost in it. And, and if you are, you know, an activist, because some people it's a career, just check where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because if you're coming from your head, if you're coming from triggers, you're not helpful. Right. You want to be the spokesperson for that cause coming from there. If you really believe in something, you want to make sure that you're coming from your soul. That's right. I, yeah. Back in the 60s and 70s, I was out there marching. And then I looked around and everybody was so angry. Yeah. And, uh, and I've always been, I've been a meditator since I was five. I didn't know what it was till I was 25. But by then I knew what it was. And I was actively meditating without it, uh, just falling into it, which I did for many, many years. And I thought, I'd rather meditate. And, you know, they have done studies with meditators and found that in a neighborhood where there are meditators, where there's a lot of meditators, there's less crime. Yes. We are creating. Meditation can create because you go into that alpha state. A creative state. And less violence in schools when kids are meditating. Kids are meditating in schools. So there's less violence. There's less. You know, this is the thing. You know, you can look at the world, and we've said it here today several times that the world is pretty crazy out there. And that there is that segment, but there's also more and more meditators coming in, no matter what religion you are or, you know, praying, all that. You, you, when you really go into a prayerful state, you go into alpha and you know everything's going to be fine. And at the same time, whether you're aware of it or not, you are creating. Alpha is the creative state. So anytime you slow down, go into a place where you feel peaceful and your analytical mind isn't going blah, 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 blah. And how to get out of that analytical mind? Again, breath. Taking that breath all the way to the end, stopping until you need to take another breath. So once you get out of that analytical mind into a place where you feel peace, you know, it may not be ecstasy. Sometimes you get into ecstasy, that's wonderful. But one of my spiritual teachers used to say that ecstasy place is just the place where you get, it's a flirtatious state with the universe. At the university, come, come more often, come more often. <laughs> it, can, it doesn't happen very often, but you always can get into a, a place of peace. And uh, that's what we're all wanting. That's, that's the smell of the musk deer. So I, there's one other topic I want to get to, because I know you want to, you want to spend some time on gratitude and I want to do that, well, I wanted to touch on grief and loss since the really people have been dealing with that such yeah. tremendous yeah. rate yeah. in the pandemic and also around the holidays, you're sort of aware of, you know, who's missing at the table or people getting ill or, and so it's such a huge topic and I wanted to, you know, uh, I, I know that ah. Ah. Yeah. grief and loss, um, everybody. <laughs> Self-acceptance, uh, really. Good. So, I'd love you to talk about that. Well, I think I've always said, I've always said the dead are with us, because when you go into that state, you can actually contact your loved ones. You can talk to them, and they're okay. They're okay. You know, it's you who are hanging on to the loss, but the loss, the loss really isn't there. 
I ask people to talk, you know, when people come in and they're grieving and they're talking about, oh, I lost my mother, no, blah, 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 blah. I don't let them do that. I say, talk to your mother. Close your eyes, breathe, feel your body, talk to your mother, feel how it is to talk to her. When they do that, of course, they will end up crying, sobbing, the body starts to let go. Right. You know, that, is, that, is, that was my work coming in to see you 30 something years ago is about grief. And mm -hmm. just doing that work over and over, talking to, allowing the sobbing and the wailing like other cultures that are healthier than ours, you know, give permission yeah. for, you know. Let us <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we take drugs and, and stop it and go through the funeral and nobody gets, well, I went to one of my relative's funerals. Nobody got up to talk. And when my mother passed, I got up and talked and cried. Yeah. You know? but, need um, some people get up and talk, but they don't really let themselves feel it. And that's what they need to do. That's the cure for grief is to let yourself feel both the sadness and the resentments, you know? So that's was an exercise that was so powerful that I use with my clients now is that you have them reach from the heart and you have them say all the things you'll miss to the person, all the things you won't miss. Mm -hmm. I'll love you forever and goodbye. That was that's sort of a very powerful uh, protocol, really, for expression. Well, people, people might have a hard time doing that by themselves. And, you know, you had mentioned when we were talking about this, finding a compassionate listener. And by that, I know that you didn't mean just listening. Because, as I said, people want to talk about it. And they'll go on year after year after year talking about their mother who died. And it doesn't heal. The healing happens when you talk to the mother who died. And because your body is involved, because you will feel. You can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about anyone. And that's, again, what I said at the beginning here is that I don't let people tell their story. They start to tell me the story. I say, wait, let's go into your body and see what the body is saying about all this. Because the feel, the body holds the real feeling truth. And I can talk about it, but if I'm not feeling it, it's going to go on and on and on and on and on. So yeah, grief is big, especially around the holidays, because it all of these people who were with us are not, but they are. The dead are with us. We carry them. In fact, I have a little quote in my will that says to my ancestors, my my children, and their um, all the people I love. Look for me in your heart, feel it and talk to me. I'll be there. I'm always there. That's my legacy to you. Well, this is a wonderful jumping off point to gratitude. So we have five minutes left. Okay. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Gratitude, I say, is one of those elevated emotions that when you really meditate into your heart center, the heart sends a message to the a chemical message to the brain, the brain slows down, the heart slows down, you go into heart brain coherence. And then those feelings come from the oxytocin in the thymus gland, and all these feelings gratitude is a feeling not a practice they say that in my 12-step program mm. I used to say gratitude was a practice 
but gratitude is really a feeling that happens in the heart. And when I'm gratitude, feeling gratitude, the heart expands. And gratitude is the experience of receiving. You know, someone gives you a gift, you feel grateful. And some people have a hard time with that. You know, they don't, they have a hard time feeling that gratitude. So they'll make a joke, <laughs> something. But that is the feeling. And when you feel that, the heart expands. The heart expands, you feel it, it expands more. And you receive more and more and more and more and more. It's wonderful. So gratitude is very, very important. And sometimes uh, people, I always talk about the apple. I love it. You know, that you find, if someone gives you an apple and you, wow, it's a beautiful apple, but there's a bite out of it. And people, that's what our lives are. You know, it's a beautiful, rich, ripe apple full of sugar, <laughs> full of sugar. And unless it's a crab apple, which aren't full of sugar, but people see the, the bite and they focus on the bite instead of looking at all the nutrition, all the love, all the sugar in the apple. So think about that. That's what you're doing when we do your work is we're turning the apple. <laughs> that's a great way of saying it. experience and if you think about the holiday season it's an antidote to all of these issues that you talked about today whether it's loneliness or your family triggers or the stresses of the world or grief and loss if you can go to gratitude and turn that apple you can come into that receiving place where all the love and blessings that are meant for you can enter because you're available to receive it Wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. Amazing. It so a lot about the work you've done on yourself. <laughs> thank you, Cherie. Thank you, Cherie. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> and thank you for being such a beautiful host for these interviews that we're doing. I love it. To get this out there, it's it's a it's it's a game changer for the world. And again, your book, Becoming Alive and Real, I have it right here. And also your website for people who might be interested in your um, in your workshops, your groups that are you do now remotely, so you can do them anywhere in the world, right? And um, yeah, so just to check I have out people your all over the world that I'm working with, the wonder of technology, which I was always kind of against. I still am against how much we're using it with children, but it's a wonderful thing too. So would you hold the book up a again a minute? I want to point out. You see that symbol at the top that has been my symbol since I started doing this work in 1970. It's the heart chakra. It's called the Anahata. And that's really what my work is about, moving into the Anahata. Okay, thank you. Okay. Love you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs>